Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, thank everybody for uh, listening to this. The, the background is that uh, in July last year we had a workshop at the KLI, the Konrad Lorenz Institute, called Toward an Extended Synthesis. And so uh, synthesis referring to the modern synthesis. Uh, a number of people think that the synthesis was essentially incomplete, for instance, and that uh, development, but also anthropology, ecology, were not really uh, part and parcel of, of uh, it. And so in addition to 13 real biologists, they invited three philosophers, including myself, and my role was to think about what it means to unify uh, biology, and I wrote a chapter for that book, and what I'm going to talk about today is mostly uh, based on uh, that, without focusing on the synthesis uh, per se. Uh, I recently stumbled upon this quote from Paul Feyerabend, uh, questioning the role of what philosophers uh, of science uh, I mean, what is their, what should be their role? So there remains a subject, philosophy of science, whose professed aim is to explicate science, which means we are not supposed to change science, but to make it clearer. The call for clarity is raised without any attention to the problems of the scientist. The machinery of explication soon gets entangled with itself, so that the main problem is now its own survival. That this struggle for survival is interesting to watch, I am the last one to deny. What I do deny is that physics or biology or psychology or even philosophy can profit from participating uh, in it. So what, what can we do? And uh, I would say with these guys, as philosophers, but also sociologists, historians uh, of biology, for instance, we uh, are faced with a rich practice and uh, we can try to clarify aspects of this practice, but with a view to what the scientists are doing. And then, of course, there is this dilemma, the formal approach, which was <laughs> mentioned before this talk, here by an Italian visitor, uh, runs the risk of, uh, you know, you lose sight of the practice uh, you originally wanted to understand, and then the other extreme, which, which uh, characterizes much uh, sociological and historical work, is that you, you, you vanish in your case study and you also lose sight. So you should find some way in between. Uh, so I'm trying to do that with respect to the issue of unity and uh, disunity focusing uh, on biology. And the talk will be in uh, five parts. So let me start with what I call the many faces of unity, because in the last 50 years or so, people have been talking exclusively about reduction in the sense of inter-theory reduction, and if inter-theory reduction fails, maybe that is a symptom of emergence of a phenomenon. But uh, the issue of, of uh, unity can be cast in a much uh, broader way. So you have to start somewhere. I'll start with Kant, not with <laughs> Aristotle, uh, who saw unity as a, regular, a regulatory uh, idea. Uh, the faculty of reason introduces as an incompletable task conditions that must be satisfied for all uh, of our knowledge to constitute a unified system such as that we act as if nature constitutes a unified whole, but is that really the case? We will probably never know. And as if it is the product of an intelligent designer in Kant's uh, case, but we can leave that out, it wouldn't. Uh, change. So this is still uh, a vivid idea today. Here is some recent literature pointing to that uh, regulatory character <coughs> of the uh, idea. Then a second, uh, probably better known uh, idea is Ewell's uh, unity as uh, consilience, maybe easiest to uh, 
illustrate if we look at the structure of Darwin's discovery of evolution by natural selection. He got the idea by analogy from artificial selection. After reading Malthus, he had the idea that he could deduce his uh, principle of natural evolution by natural selection from the Malthusian principle, scarcity, uh, and that made his theory look Newtonian, which was crucial in his day. But what really concerned him, and here he spent 20 years, as you know, between uh, having the idea and then publishing the origin, was looking at all possible facts that would uh, would say confirm the theory if you have the arrows in uh, the other way. Here it is presented as a deductive structure. So, consilience refers to, to gathering this um, uh, evidence from all possible kinds of uh, sources. Uh, E.O. Wilson, as many of you will know, wrote a, a book uh, by the same <coughs> name. If you go back to the original logical positivism of the Vienna Circle, uh, they were striving for unity, but they, they were mostly looking for unity in terms of translation. Uh, there was Neurath's encyclopedism, which is actually not very clear. It's never, I read a few books about it, I still don't really understand what he was after. In Carnap's case, it was uh, more obvious. He first tried to unify the languages of the various sciences in terms of a phenom phenomenal language, so, so describing a subject's uh, personal experience of the world that didn't really work and then he uh, tried a, a physicalist language but this is not physicalism in the sense that it is now used in for instance the philosophy of mind it refers to what Neurad calls cows and calves physics so you describe the world in terms of you know the kinds of objects that, that surround us like for instance uh, <coughs> in this uh, <coughs> room that second program also was not very successful. Then there was this altogether different attempt to unify the sciences by looking for isomorphisms at various uh, levels. Uh, and think it's fair to say that this program also largely failed. I mean, it survives in various more specialized kinds of systems uh, theory. But the original idea of a general systems theory, I think, uh, has mostly disappeared. <clears throat> to run this introduction off, uh, I want to point to this uh, interesting idea that instead of a ladder of sciences reflecting levels uh, of uh, reality where you have the issue what is fundamental, and the answer is, of course, always physics, is the fundamental uh, level. You could conceive of a circle of the sciences. This is what Jean Piaget, the Swiss biologist, psychologist, did in a novel he wrote as when he was about 20. And in this novel, he basically lays out the program that would occupy him for the rest uh, of uh, his life. So this, this is uh, something that, as far as I know, has never been worked out. It's just re this is an alternative um, representation of the same uh, <coughs> idea in terms of uh, <coughs> Escher's self-portrait. Uh, so the divisions between the disciplines are an artifact, are, are a result of, of uh, institutionalization and specialization, but they have no uh, foundation in nature itself. Okay, let uh, me, this is anticipating what I will uh, be saying at the end, but so we, we could have a kind of synthetic unity that differs from a successful uh, reduction. In a successful reduction, two phenomena are being identified as being of the same kind, that is Typically, you give up one in favor of the 
other, the more fundamental uh, one. But you could think of integration of, for instance, two separate processes or phenomena under one uh, theory. The failure of micro uh, reduction. I think it's fair to say that uh, the idea of micro reduction, reducing uh, theory about a whole at some level to a theory or theories about the parts of this whole at a lower level has its roots in Carnap's uh, physicalist uh, program. Uh, and and in, in time, this more or less coincides with uh, what a physicist like Dirac, the, the purest soul among the physicists, according to Neil Bohr, uh, uh, thought, and actually this is what each generation of physicists has been preaching for about a century now. Physics is, all, we're almost there. Actually, uh, they, they usually tell their students do something different because there's not much interesting <laughs> work left uh, in physics. So the underlying laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are completely known. The difficulty is only that exact appli applications of these law laws lead to equations that are too complicated to be soluble. And that, that's then the kind of what philosophers of science would call it's a pragmatic aspect of the, but not really uh, fundamental. Okay, uh, I just introduced the term physicalism for the non-philosophers among you who aren't acquainted with this. Uh, nowadays, philosophers usually don't talk about materialism. And one, one reason is that since Einstein, matter and energy have become uh, unified. And so physicalism is, um, is the term that is now... Uh, uh, used mostly in this replacing materialism. Uh, you, one way of putting it is it is true at a possible world if and only if any world which is a physical duplicate of this world is a duplicate of the world simpliciter. So that's a complicated way uh, of saying that uh, everything uh, is made out of the same stuff, mat matter, uh, uh, energy, and that, for instance, in biology, there, there, there is no extra substance. Um, I want to relate this to two things, the physics envy of biologists, and in looking at the, the, the way the modern synthesis was, was made, I was struck by the, by the inspiration that many of these architects got from, uh, from physics. And then with respect to philosophy uh, of mind, uh, people talk a lot about physicalism in the philosophy of uh, mind, but usually they don't care to look at any real physics. So that's, I think, part of the problem in this uh, field. Okay, so micro-reduction, I think this idea is, is uh, uh, very well uh, known. So you, you posit a level structure of uh, reality and then you can, you have this part whole uh, relation and uh, each arrow uh, stands for a reduction step and if you can um, uh, accomplish all the steps, uh, you reduce everything to the most fundamental level. The, the, the choice of levels is arbitrary but the idea is I mean, you could have 14 instead of uh, 6, you could specify the elementary particles and so on. But the idea is this, this transitivity of the reduction uh, relation, and if you invert the arrow, you get deduction from, from lower to uh, higher. This, the idea of linking uh, reduction to this part-whole relation is, is due to uh, Kemeny, Oppenheim, Putnam mostly. There have been other uh, attempts to formalize reduction, most, most familiar Ernest Nagels, which do not refer to this part-whole um, idea. Uh, the, the original Oppenheim and Putnam proposal was also 
uh, was inspired by evolutionary uh, theory. Let me just <coughs> read this quote. Let us, as is customary in science, assume causal determination as a guiding principle. That is, let us assume that things that appear later in time can be accounted for in terms of things and processes at earlier times. Then if we find that there was a time when a certain whole did not exist and that things on a lower level came together to form that whole, it is very natural to suppose that the characteristics of the whole can be causally explained by reference to these earlier events and parts and that the theory of these characteristics can be micro-reduced by a theory involving only characteristics of the parts. This was their famous 50, 1958 uh, article and it could be po pointed out here that we what we face here is a typical example of the, the tendency to identify causal order with logical order. And in an article uh, that seems to be completely overlooked in recent discussions, this is by an Australian philosopher, I don't know, maybe scientist, uh, 1961, Schlesinger, uh, he points out that the logical order of statements about the properties of different entities is independent of their physical order of succession. The former is determined solely by the structure of the unifying theory. The laws governing macroscopic entities are not by themselves entailed by the laws governing microscopic entities, even though the former entities physically result from the latter. And so Schlesinger is asking why focus on micro-reduction, you could also conceive of macro-reductions. And, and he points to some historical uh, uh, examples, Stevens' derivation of the law of the composition and resolution of forces acting on a single particle from the behavior of an endless chain, so an aggregate of such uh, particles. <clears throat> the conclusion is that there are no objective grounds on which to maintain uh, that a reducing theory will naturally be more readily available or is more strictly in conformity with the deterministic view or is for reasons of economy or elegance in any way more desirable. And Schlesinger, and this is actually, this anticipates uh, in, I mean, things, uh, views that are vo have been voiced recently about uh, the Problematic, problematic character of this idea that physics uh, is fundamental, but I'll return to that in a, mid in a minute. Schlesinger very pessimistically concluded, uh, because everybody makes this mistake of confusing logical uh, and natural order uh, from Aristotle to Wittgenstein, this micro-reduction program will be accomplished, but it will, it will be a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy in a way. Um, well, another correction, uh, people adopting this micro-reduction view have often criticized Nagel's alternative account of um, reduction. Uh, Nagel insisted that reductions are accomplished by the introduction of a postulate of correlation. For instance, uh, temperature in thermodynamics is proportional to mean kinetic uh, energy in mechanics. Uh, that equation is not something that will be revealed by any logical analysis. It's scientific work, you know, to find that kind of uh, identification. And so Nagel's idea was reduction can succeed to the extent that uh, the vocabulary of the reducing theory allows you to take in that sort of information. I mean, you have to be able in the reducing theory to talk about the relevant phenomena, uh, the, the, the theory you want to be uh, reduced. Uh, talks about. Now, post nagelian discussions of reduction have uh, gone in a different direction. 
And I'm thinking especially of the philosophy of uh, mind, they have considered metaphysical relationships between the reference of scientific terms, so roughly identical with composed of nomically, so in, uh, nom nomically in terms of laws, coextensive uh, with some complications for any reductionist or micro-reductionist uh, program. Uh, first of all, this, again, I think, very well-known idea of multiple uh, re uh, realizability inspired by computer science. Uh, you can uh, have interesting generalizations in some what Fodor has called special science. So S, for instance, let's say in economics, a law, uh, law uh, saying something about the way inflation is related to unemployment, something uh, like that. Now, inflation would ultimately refer to money, and you could ask what corresponds to money at the physical level. And this is, of course, a very tricky thing. You're not going to look for metals or the chemical composition of paper or something, uh, because these are just tokens. But you know, money is about credibility and that sort of thing. So it's going to be very difficult. But the, but the message here was that you're going to get decomposition. And what is an interesting generalization at a higher level, and the kind of thing special scientists are, sciences are interested in, are all about, uh, to that will, at a lower level, will typically correspond a mess. And so there is nothing to be gained from actually trying to accomplish this kind of uh, reduction. Uh, this has also been tied to the very philosophical idea of supervenience. Uh, basically, if you, uh, let's say, uh, you have a, a microstructure and you duplicate it, then you will automatically get the same uh, macrostructure. But the macrostructure can be uh, <coughs> implemented, realized in a number of ways. So there are, there are nice uh, formal accounts of supervenience. The problem, one problem is that philosophers have never been able to sell this idea to scientists to ask what, what work does it do, it doesn't do anything uh, for me. There are also, as in many of these issues I've been discussing here, problems of testability. Uh, for instance, John Dupree has pointed out that evidence for supervenience would be the kind of evidence also necessary for reductionism. It would be evidence that higher level phenomena are indeed determined by lower level phenomena or that identical or sufficiently similar lower level phenomena do indeed produce the same higher level phenomena. As in the case with evidence for reductionism, the problem is that where such evidence exists at all, it is in a narrow range of quite specialized cases and the legitimacy of extrapolation to a general philosophical thesis is questionable. Uh, another complication for any reductionist program is probably downward uh, causation. My favorite example is, uh, let's assume that the, our human appendix lost its function because of changes in nutritional habits, so a cultural phenomenon impinging on physiological and maybe even anatomical uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, I don't think this is ultimately a big problem because reductionists could take this into uh, account. It complicates the picture, but it, it, it can be dealt with uh, somehow. And if you look at, for instance, the, the current literature on systems biology, where they like to talk about emergence, not reduction, I could make this correspond one-to-one -one to pronouncements 30 years ago in favor of reduction. So often it's just the, the label that has been changed. You pay lip service to nonlinearity in your feedbacks and lo and behold, this is now 
uh, emergence, but reductionists of some generations ago claimed, rightly or not, that they could take this into uh, account. And then, of course, emergence, and I told Tony before the talk that among, I mean, there's this not huge literature yet, but there is a fair amount of it, and that I really prefer Terry Deacon's uh, take uh, on it, which is uh, less philosophical than many of the others I cite here. Oh, Tony, this is the this is the one we were talking about before, right? So, um, but it's an attempt by a scientist to make sense. <laughs> Uh, of it. Uh, since my topic is unity, I will, I will not uh, go into any details here. I mean, emergence uh, seems to signal a failure of reduction and therefore of a certain kind of unity. But this is certainly the most fascinating direction to go. And as, as you point out, until now, emergence has been seen in a purely negative light. It's the failure of reduction, uh, full stop. But maybe it is possible to say something positive by way of characterizing it. And I think this, these two articles uh, uh, are a nice uh, first take on, on this. Um, I won't say much more about it, but examples of chaotic systems and systems that undergo phase transitions are not instances of emergence uh, or of ontological emergence. Maybe they can be called epistemological uh, emergence. But there is this other thing, and here I anticipate uh, what I want to say about this so-called myth of fundamentality in a few minutes. Emergency, emergentism, warrants its name because it holds that higher levels of organization emerge, <laughs> or fulgurate, Lorenz uh, would have said, because emerge seems to suggest that it was already there before. Uh, so there, there is no good word for it. So fulgurate indeterminably out of lower level ones and then causally feed back downward. Now there are some philosophers of physics who question the very idea of a structuring, uh, structuring of the world in levels. They, they, question, they say that quantum physics uh, doesn't warrant that kind of view. And then, of course, uh, the question is, what, how is it possible to uh, formulate f physicalism in, in the uh, aforementioned uh, sense in a way that takes into account with, with uh, uh, of, of this, and, and they have a positive proposal, and in fact, they try to formulate f uh, physicalism as a testable and refutable uh, uh, hypothesis, and they, and they also connect predictions to it, namely that uh, physics in a foreseeable future will not uh, allow for the incorporation of terms that you would need for a reduction uh, of the mental. But this is a quite technical uh, discussion. To, to round off what I wanted to say about micro-reduction, the philosophers among you will be familiar with this is the ultimate statement of the reduction doctrine uh, where the upshot is that you cannot reduce any theory to any other theory, but what you can do in certain circumstances is to reduce a so-called corrected version of the theory to be reduced to a corrected version of the reducing uh, theory. And then you can argue about the amount of analogy between the targeted uh, theories and the corrected versions uh, of them. Too many people, especially in philosophy of biology, uh, has, and this epicycles on epicycles was David Hull's comment on, on this here. You can go on making things more complicated by adding ad hoc clauses, but this really seems to be signaling the death of the, of the whole idea. And I'm afraid that in philosophy of mind, even I mean, this was published in '93. That's 15 years ago. But in philosophy, in the philosophy of mind, 
there are people today who are still playing with these kinds of ideas, for instance, the churchlands. Um, a philosopher of chemistry looking at this mess uh, has proposed some years ago to you know, a moratorium on the use of words such as reduction, supervenience, and unification, and going back to the rough ground and give perspicuous renderings of the practice of chemistry in uh, his case. So you have, in, with, when I go back to biology, you have this paradoxical development that the people who set out to show the reducibility of transmission genetics, so the Mendelian genetics that it had developed uh, in the 1950s roughly, the, re the reduction of transmission genetics to molecular uh, genetics, and they were enthusiastic in the beginning that it, this, this would succeed. Uh, but by 1980 or thereabout, uh, most of the people involved in this, including uh, Hull, Wimsett, but there were many others, have reached the conclusion that it just won't work for some of the reasons I mentioned before, multiple realizability, so not one-to-one -one mappings, but many-to-one or even many-to-many -many in certain cases. And so there is this, oh, what has been called the anti-reductionist consensus uh, about biology, uh, in fact, the only philosopher of biology who does not subscribe to it is basically Alex Rosenberg. And as you may know or not know, Alex Rosenberg is usually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was also this article which said it wouldn't work, but if you read this today, it's not uh, being very helpful. So. You, fi you find similar um, statements in the um, philosophy of mind. Uh, reductionism is an unattractive position. Uh, there has been a consensus, I mean, this is the very word the, bi the biologists use, that, that philosophers of biology use, that reductionism is a mistake, that there are autonomous special sciences based on an argument from multiple realizability. But the problem is, as this philosopher of chemistry, who is at UCLA, or is he here? No not here, UCLA, I think, points out, scientists are less inclined to admit defeat over the question of reduction, and broadly speaking, the reductive approach, whether entirely successful or not, remains at the heart of modern science. So this is the problem of philosophers again. You know, uh, what are we doing? And so if you look at more technical philosophical literature, for instance here, a book and an article by Joseph Robinson, it's biochemistry. Um, you, you find uh, uh, a lot of careful attention to uh, the possibility of reduction. And as he points out, the prospect for explanation uh, through such reduction, as in the case of uh, Starling's law, depends on the validity of commonplace assumptions, including ontological and homological reductionism, causality at the molecular level, the inductive requirement that the future resembles the past, but for most biochemists, previous success is sufficient reason for not thinking of these considerations, much less worrying about them. The practical concerns include defining the best ways for deciding between ambiguous conflicting data for defining the consequences of alternative formulations, avoiding artifacts of method and theory, recognizing pertinent analogies and generalizations, inventing new techniques and explanations. But the final form of the explanation seems clear, reducing the gross phenomena to the consequence of physical chemical interactions between identified uh, molecules. Let's not spend... Well, well this is actually nice. Uh, this is from the blurb of Alex Rosenberg's latest book defending um, reductionism. Uh, Rosenberg argues that we can show the paradigm facts of biology, evolution and development 
are built from the chemical and physical and re reduced to them. Moreover, he argues unpleasantly plausibly that defenders of the consensus must, the anti-reductionist consensus, must slip one way or the other into spookiness about the biological or into a reduction program for the biological. People like me have no middle way, bugger. Right? <laughs> this is Kim Sterelny. Okay. Um, more or less in parallel to the this anti-reductionist consensus, which, as the, I think, hope the last quote shows, that we're in some kind of conceptual vacuum there. I mean, we agree that reduction doesn't work, but wh where to go from here? Uh, in parallel to this, there has, there has been a movement against unity as such. Uh, I won't say too much about it, but they, these people are usually referred to as the Stanford Disunity Mafia. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, John Dupree. Interestingly, uh, especially the kinds of arguments that, that John Dupree uh, uses echo arguments one finds in, in, in Cold War uh, debates, you know, there is, as Gallison, one of these uh, people has uh, uh, pointed out in an, a very interesting article called The Americanization of Unity, uh, when, the, when the Vienna Circle, the logical positivist, uh, when, the, when the representatives of this movement uh, emigrated and, and came to the U.S., uh, they had to dissociate themselves from many of the previous, I mean, some of them were even communists, you know, so unity was, was associated with uh, striving for p political unification and all that, so th all this had to go, obviously. And, and uh, George Reich, in this marvelous book, as far as I'm concerned, uh, goes into uh, all these discussions and, and by the way, and you know, as, as an aside points out that the priest's arguments for disunity are already in this 1940s, 50s cold um, war literature, interestingly. So the priest's idea roughly is if science were unified, the legitimate projects of inquiry would be those and only those that form part of that unified whole. But, he says on the picture, I'm presenting only a society with absolutely homogeneous or at least hegemonic political commitments and shared assumptions could expect a unified science. Unified science would require utopia or total totalitarianism. Um, or here Gallison and Stump, uh, recent years have seen a turn largely against the rhetoric of unity, so now they are talking about rhetoric instead of a legitimate philosophical research program. In discussions ranging from the pleas of condensed matter physicists for disciplinary autonomy, all the way to discussion in the humanities and social sciences of local history, feminism, multiculturalism, scientific relativism and realism, and social constructivism. So this is about the, the, the super collider. Uh, that's quite expensive, and maybe you can spend your money more profitably, profitably uh, on different uh, things. I think the most sophisticated version of this, uh, this unity program, if one can call it so, is uh, Nancy Cartwright's uh, book, uh, The Doubled uh, World. She is a philosopher of physics and economics. And uh, let's not go into this, it will take too much time. My problem is I don't see how I can apply, transfer any of this to biology. Uh, I mean, it works in these highly formalized sciences like physics and uh, economics. I don't know how, how to transfer this to um, biology. So, uh, let me move on to my fourth section. Uh, there is talk of new 
uh, reductionisms. Uh, I'm doing this very, very, very uh, quickly here. Uh, Kim, a sufficient cause of an event excludes any appeal to a further uh, cause. Now we're talking about uh, the relation between uh, mind and brain here. Dilemma and acceptance of consciousness, qualia, as real entails a denial of the claim that everything real is physical. An acceptance of physicalism seems to entail a denial of the reality of consciousness. Solution interprets such a counterexample. This is not Kim's, uh, this is someone else's. Uh, solution interpret such a counterexample as a failure in theory reduction rather than ontological uh, reduction. Then there was, I didn't find a better picture of Donald Davidson. <laughs> <laughs> the anomalousness of the mental. Uh, the problem here was uh, what do you do if you jointly accept these three rather obvious things? The, Causal interaction, some mental events interact causally with physical ones. Uh, nomological character of causality, events related as cause and effect have descriptions that fall under a strict deterministic law. And anomalousness of the mental, there are no strict deterministic laws on the basis of which mental events can be predicted uh, and uh, explained. Now one way to deal with this is to give up the classical version of the micro-reduction doctrine where you need these bridge laws uh, and, and uh, adopt more kind of uh, Nagel uh, uh, approach. Uh, for instance, Cliff Hooker and, and the Churchlands have this modified account of inter-theoretic uh, reduction that does without bridge laws. On their account, an inter-theoretic reduction is a proof of displaceability, demonstrating that a more comprehensive reducing theory has explanatory and predictive resources that parallel those of the reduced theory. What gets deduced, that's the difference with the classical model, is an analog structure already specified within the vocabulary of the reducing uh, theory, the approximately equipotent isomorphic image of the reduced theory, the target of a kind of complex mimicry, as someone calls it. So here we are back to Schaffner and his epicycles on epicycles, I would uh, say. Davidson's objection based on the impossibility of psychophysical laws fails for the lack of Cross-theoretic laws is of no consequence to whether uh, a Hooker-Churchland reduction is possible since such a reduction does not require bridge laws. That's the idea. It's reasonable to think of intentional psychology as a theory in the specific sense required to stand in NHC reduction. Uh, it has to be statable uh, as a theory and syntactically stable. If the mental is anomalous, might that not pose a barrier to the derivation of an equipotent uh, isomorphic image of anomalous intentional psychology from non-anomalous cognitive neurobiology? Here the reductionist, the new reductionist, might argue that instead of constituting evidence for irreducibility, Davidson's principle of anomalousness constitutes evidence for a future or replacement uh, reduction, and thus for an eliminativist ontology of mind, which is what the Churchlands uh, always um, wanted. One can also just uh, reject Davidson's principle and saying, after, I mean, after all, what, what, what is the evidence uh, for it? But the most radical way to go is to uh, question uh, the very law, law likeliness of statements in both the uh, theory to be reduced, intentional psychology, and at the neuro uh, uh, scientific uh, level. And there is some literature by philosophers of physics mostly, 
Ronald Geary, Baswan Frasen, uh, that argues for this idea that laws don't really play a crucial role. They, you need them to, for didactic purposes, to explain things to your students, but they don't play a heuristic role in at the actual research uh, uh, front. And of course, if you don't have laws, then this whole uh, reductionism program uh, collapses. Uh, and moving to my final considerations, um, this book, unfortunately not translated into English, shows beautifully, as far as I'm concerned, and this is you know, coming closer to scientific practice, scientists don't usually talk about theories, but they work with models and they, they do things with models. Now, if you think of it, Modeling, I mean, you could say it starts with uh, Lotka, Volterra, or thereabout. It's a different way of doing science from what someone like Newton was doing. Newton was really interested in the big picture, in a unified picture. But if you uh, rest sufficient with models, you have you pay the price. I mean, there's a lot to be gained by uh, working with models, but you know, you can model, you can build several models, you can build an indefinite number of models of the same phenomenon. And a model can be a model of several phenomena simultaneously. So there is a kind of arbitrariness here that, that, that crucially departs from the, the unified science someone like um, Newton had in mind and so I would say modeling itself acts as a disunifier but can also obviously act as a as a unifier think of game theory actually I think I have that um, in a <coughs> further in a later slide then there are new reductionisms based on developments in uh, physics, for instance, people often refer to the Santa Fe uh, group in this uh, respect. An interesting point to note here is that reductivist accounts of complex molecules, organic structures, must rely on the familiar atoms and properties of the periodic table, not on anticipations of future theory. So, for instance, in McKinnon here made this comparison of recent work in physics and uh, in philosophy of mind and points out that the kind of um, uh, reduction that philosophers of mind want cannot be exemplified by, by physics. The physics are, physicists are after altogether different uh, things and, and ultimately this is the, we're back to the question that I already referred to when I was mentioning uh, James Ladyman and his book, uh, All Things Must Go. Are there levels in nature at all? Uh, and if so, why is it that we believe that physics is about a fundamental uh, level? You could consider uh, adopting uh, an egalitarian ontology where all, all kinds of things uh, get the same kind of uh, ontological weight. And Max Dresden, a uh, physicist who worked at one of these national, this huge, I forget the name now, he was a famous <laughs> physicist, has these throughout his career has been thinking about this issue of fundamentality. Of the, uh, if there's one article, I mean, if you want to go walk out of this with uh, one reading assignment, I, I would say look at one of these, the old or the new uh, paper by um, Dresden, who points out that physicists still have this dream, I 
I mentioned Dirac before, but that this goes on and on, grand unified theory nowadays and so on, but that this cannot possibly work even within, if you stay within the confines of physics, as soon as you move to a somewhat applied area, within physics, uh, you have to give up uh, 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 this idea of, of uh, deductive closure and you have to, in, to operationalize things or in, in, in the interesting case of moving beyond scales, you know, to, 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 to uh, further scales, you, you, you have to introduce new principles and the idea of fundamentality is just not to be upheld. So, final section, the representation of practice unity through integration. As I said at the beginning, uh, what inspired my work on this was the question, what made the modern synthesis, uh, in, why was it uni how was it unifying uh, biology? Our first step, I think, to take is, if you want to understand what goes on in scientific practice, as a philosopher, stop thinking in terms of theories only. There is much more involved in science and scientific change than theory change. So, if you still stay at a conceptual level, you can think about fields, um, as defined by uh, Lindley Darden and uh, her group. Let me shift at once to this idea of interfields. You have a central problem in field A, in this case, that you cannot solve in that field. Well, but you borrow methods, techniques, for instance, concepts, from a second field B, and to, to get across this, you, you develop an interfield C. So, for instance, evolutionary developmental biology uh, can be seen as such an interfield where you cannot solve certain problems in evolutionary theory without essentially invoking development. Uh, and in this case, it works both ways. There's also problems in developmental biology that you can only solve by relying on evolutionary ideas. So you get a double kind of um, interfield. You can apply this to the modern synthesis, but that is my other talk. Um, then a second, I think, extremely crucial point, hacking also somehow belonged to the Stanford Disunity Mafia, but he's a very clever guy, and so he has a more balanced uh, idea, and he pointed out that if you look at the history of science, more unification has probably been the consequence of regimes and practices of experimentation, instrumentation, than, than theory uh, uh, reduction. And I have looked at, tried to apply this idea to Evo Devo by looking at some uh, methods used there. But the most spectacular uh, example of uh, unifying two, as far as I'm concerned, is game theory, which started out as uh, a theory of strategic interaction, so among intentional agents, then was applied to um, animal behavior, you know, evolutionary stable strategies, that sort of thing, so non-intentional uh, behavior and nowadays it's being used by biochemists to analyze uh, complex chemical uh, reactions. So that's uh, it's gone a long uh, way. So to wrap up, I think one could say with Margaret Morrison, once we have an, some understanding of how unity is produced, its implication for a metaphysics of nature, its role in theory construction and confirmation, it will cease to occupy the undesirable role attributed to it by the advocates of uh, this unity. Uh, then the question is how does reduction and more generally uni unification uh, connect to explanation, which is the main thing that you're after in science. And uh, I think there too one has to be a bit 
moderate and tolerant and accept that there are two kinds of explanations, bottom-up, causal mechanistic, and top-down show how the objects of explanation belong to a class of phenomena that are derivable from a common argument uh, pattern. These two views are uh, compatible. Uh, derivation as such is not explanation, yet true explanations ought to provide us with the how and why at work in any particular pattern or process we attempt to explain. If you look at the early modern synthesis in biology, structural unity was achieved at the level of the mathematical models, you know, uh, Fisher, Haldane, Sewell, right? Um, but but this, on one interpretation, was still not uh, an explanatory uh, unification. One could say, uh, yeah, okay, let me just finish this. Often scientists seek the big picture, a theoretical framework, and reasons for adopting it. This often appeals to mathematical argument or demonstration, importance of how possibly and why necessarily uh, questions. So Plutinsky is saying against... Uh, Morrison, you have to uh, accept that there can be more at stake than just causal mechanistic explanation. You, you may have these other epistemic uh, aims in science. But the point I wanted to make is that if you, going back to the modern synthesis, uh, what distinguishes modern synthesis, evolutionary theory, from many of the uh, things going on today, including Evo Devo is that it is gradually becoming possible to give answers to how questions in addition to why questions. So whereas modern synthesis uh, evolutionary theory has been mostly concerned with ultimate questions, uh, Evo Devo and other developments provide more and more tool systems biologists synthetic biology to also answer um, how uh, questions and so to I think I should really stop here to, uh, to there is a nice beginning in the philo philosophy of biology literature mostly on, me on mechanistic explanations what it is to explain something causal, causally mechanistically uh, and for instance, Carl Craver has applied some of these ideas to neuroscience, which is definitely not my cup of tea, but for those interested, I could uh, give you those uh, references. So to sum up the whole thing, I will refer to Jim Griesermer, who has made a nice analogy between unification in science and political unification. Cooperation and communication among theoretical and phenomenal equals rather than imperialism and competition for primacy and fundamentality, which reduces or replaces one theory by another or tri trivializes one explanandum as epiphenomenal to another. An explanatory domain can become integrated when its bumps, twists and turns are smoothly traversable we need not achieve integration by leveling the domain and making it conceptually homogeneous, just as nation states can be unified by the smooth flow of goods, services, people and ideas across their borders, rather than by the obliteration of local and regional differences, making flow uh, irrelevant. To which, of course, the postmodernist can say, but modern nation building also doesn't uh, work, but that's already part of the discussion. So let me stop here. And one more thing. So, so I said we had this workshop um, last year in uh, July, and actually some of you may have, or the, the, biologi the biologists of you may have heard about this, because there was this interesting development um, journalist, an investigative journalist, seized upon this and compared this workshop, this was four months before it took place, to Woodstock. And so that then as a result you have someone writing in science, this was the day 
a report on our workshop published on the day the workshop started. <laughs> In science, beginning with Massimo Piliucci, who was one of the organizers, is no Jimi Hendrix. And, you know, um, it was funny because then I got calls from graduate students asking if they could put their tent in the garden of the Conrad Lorenz Institute and if we would provide marijuana and, and so on. Uh, so I hope for you that you will never meet a journalist like Susan Mazur. We can complicate your life uh, terribly. So this is, um, this. I will say more about not Susan Mazur, but about the contents of this workshop.